line to buy one on one of the Interfaith Alliance is one of the partner organizations. And if you have seen the email about Moral Mondays at Iowa or the handout sheet that's here at the top of the table, um, you can see all of the organizations that are part of this project. This is the completion of the third year that we've done Moral Mondays at Iowa, and we really strive to bring issues to you that are important to each of us um, and to educate you on those and, and also give you tools to be activists on those issues. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm sure Representative Chris Hall will join us at some point. He'll be part of the public hearing and, and hopefully he'll be up here in a little bit. Uh, Representative Chris Hall from Sioux City. Um, but we have with us Senator Nate Bolton from Des Moines and we're going to talk about that all important very important issue of the budget. So I'm going to turn it over to Senator Bolton. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, the budget is not what we hope for, right? I mean, what we're learning in this process is uh, this is the result of years of mismanagement of our budget by Governor Branson and Lieutenant Governor Reynolds catching up to us. And the reality is we don't have to be in this mess. There are two very easy answers to a lot of these budget problems. Less corporate tax giveaways. I mean, when we're blowing a $500 million hole in our budget every year, that adds up. And the consequences of that add up. We're not collecting taxes from corporations and then writing them checks as tax credits. That's a double hit to our state's finances. And now we're in a position where we have to deal with that, that budget mismanagement. So uh, as a result, we're also trying to uh, repay the rainy day fund immediately. Uh, rather than planning for economic growth long term that allows us to repay it with increased revenue in our state, we're basically ensuring further cuts. And then we're ensuring further cuts even further down the line because the departments, the agencies, and the branch of government that actually generate resources for our state are seeing disproportionate cuts to their budget. Uh, Republicans will tell you that the courts, the judicial branch of government, was held harmless. That's not true. They are seeing the same $3 million cut to their resources they saw last year, again this year. And our courts are doing everything they can to provide justice to our citizens on a limited amount of resources that they can't sustain long term. We have to have judges filling open vacancies at some point. We have to be able to ensure people in rural Iowa have the same access to the court system that urban Iowans have access to the court system. And those things, when we have a, a justice system that runs well, it allows for revenues to actually be generated into our budget. And it allows economic certainty as well. Businesses, corporations would like to see cases resolved in a timely manner rather than cases pending for a long amount of time with uncertain results. So those things would help the budget. Uh, when we look at public safety in our communities, it's great that uh, the, the budget allows for a few more troopers to be on the highways, but at the same time, we again are reducing the amount of staffing in our correctional institutions. So when we make those places less safe, we're not really fixing the safety and security of our communities that we hope to advance. Uh, when we see a, an entirely disproportionate cut to, to victim services, domestic violence, uh, women who are abused, uh, I mean, that's, that's disheartening, but it's also ridiculous because a 22% cut doesn't mean that much in dollars and cents, as opposed to other agencies that, that could bear that burden. So uh, it's a really, really heartless approach to the budgeting process. It's short-sighted. Again, we're cutting things that actually lead to revenue production. Um, in the long term, and, and these are essential services. And then, you know, the, the third thing that is very troubling is the, the cuts to REAP. And, uh, you know, in a, in a state where we have uh, seen less and less commitment to protecting our natural resources and embracing a tourism opportunity of showcasing Iowa as a, as a nature tourism destination, now we're cutting the, the, the funding to the programs that actually help us preserve and protect natural resources in our state. So. Uh, it's really, really disappointing because it's not necessary, and now it's, if, if this budget passes as it is, it's going to compromise our ability to come back from this type of budget. So uh, it's very disappointing. Uh, we appreciate everyone who came out today to make sure that, that our, our legislators understood the impact these cuts would have on various groups of our citizens, but the reality is our state as a whole is put in a worse position uh, because of this plan. So. Uh, I appreciate you coming out today.
Christmas. I also took the stairs, so I'm catching my breath. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Chris Hall. I'm a Democrat from Sioux City, ranking member on the uh, House Appropriations Committee. Thank you for accommodating just a little bit of time and getting up here. Um, <clears throat> truly. The public hearing, I think, was really a extremely important step for the public to understand who is affected and who is really most adversely impacted by the GOP budget this year. What I think most of us who are down there heard are that it is Iowa's most vulnerable citizens. It is the least among us. It is, uh, I kept the list going, it's not only students and low-income women, it's uh, victims of domestic violence, uh, it is children who are seeing scholarship dollars for preschool cut. Um, it's just across the board issues that are affecting working families more than anyone, while still some of the same uh, corporate tax cuts and corporate tax credits that we've been trying to point out are becoming a greater and greater drain on the state's budget are held harmless. Uh, seeing that juxtaposition is something that I think all of us really need to tune in. We need to better understand that the budget is not something abstract. It's not something that uh, only happens during a brief period of the legislative session. It is something that also should be a reflection of Iowa's values. It should reflect who we are as people. It should reflect our priorities and the things that we believe uh, in, in making sure that the least among us are taken care of. We also need to make sure that that is reflected in a budget and dollar sense making sure that those programs are also funded at points when the state's budget is truly lean. If we can't afford to take care of victims of domestic violence, who could potentially be one in four Iowa women, if we can't afford to make sure that scholarship dollars for poor working families are held, uh, held full in these tight budget years, at the same time that $400 million of tax credits are kind of looked at briefly, but only for a news story in a press conference. I'm sitting on that subcommittee that uh, Pat Grassley has introduced, you know, a tax credit bill, and it's, it's all in namesake, it's all little head fakes just to get the news uh, wound up and said, uh, we're trying to make a difference here, we're trying to pare these things back. But if you ever uh, sat through any of those subcommittee meetings, they were not substantive, they offered no public input, uh, they certainly didn't allow for you and I and, and the public to really have a place where we said, here's something reasonable and rational that also will improve our state's budget. Instead, they turned into media frenzies and press conferences. And I really think it was unfortunate that people gave credit to the idea he was actually trying to pare back tax credits at a point that he's completely held them harmless and that bill is going to die before the end of the week. Uh, there's been no true effort made by the GOP and the legislature this year to correct the inadequacies of the state budget and to actually make it something that truly puts people first and puts them first ahead of corporations. Uh, the state budget process isn't working. We've seen that, we know now that a few brief years ago we had $900 million in surplus that's now been thrown $130 million into deficit. And I think it's also time for those of us who have those good relationships across the aisle with Republicans and fiscal-minded independents as well as Democrats, start talking to these people about what is fiscally responsible about this budget. I mean, if, if this is something that Republicans in the legislature truly believe at their core, if this is something that they believe uh, is an important principle, what piece of their budget actually shows fiscal responsibility? It's short-sighted. These are dollars that if you cut them now will end up falling back on taxpayers in the near future and certainly in the long future. Uh, but they're also dollars uh, where they are creating new projects and creating new programs like a voter suppression bill that passed and cost $700,000. At the same time, they're underfunding critical services to Iowa's most vulnerable. It just doesn't make sense and there's nothing conservative about it. It's just mean-spirited. It's grudge politics and you can see that they're using the budget as a vehicle to take out political vendettas against groups that they disagree with. And uh, we should all be disheartened by that, and we should all also feel compelled to get involved and make sure that other people are there with us. We've, we've also, apart from the budget itself, seen, seen some hints recently uh, that, that IPERS may be the next target for, for fixing some finances in our state. Uh, in January, we had Lieutenant Governor Reynolds calling for an IPERS tax, task force. 
Uh, in March, you had the governor saying we need to look at changes in IFERS. And then uh, just in here in April, uh, I was on a, a, a TV show with the Senate Appropriations Chair saying we need to look at IFERS and cost savings there. Well, you know, that's, that's a pretty uh, telling set of, of individuals who are kind of planting a seed that this, this is something to look at as well. Uh, let's be clear, we don't need to fix IFRS for the retirees that benefit from it. It would be only to raid that program or, or do something to shift some, some budget uh, items to, to make that less solvent and more of a, a cash vehicle for state government. So uh, being out in front of that is going to be important as well. Uh, I know we have a fight right in front of us right now on the budget that is right, uh, ready for consideration this week. But keep an eye on that in the future because there's, there are too many words being, being tossed around about that program for it not to be in the long-term plan. A couple other points that I think, you know, I'd be curious, especially the, the budget and there might be better questions than we could really even, you know, dive into and maybe that would be a more interesting then for part of today's presentation. Um, the budget is hard to grasp at. It's hard to understand if you walk into this building and you only get a first glance at your line item being cut. You don't know what the process is or some of the sleight of hand that Republicans have used to siphon off dollars into these kind of off-book tax credits and tax cuts and then make sure that uh, they're also level and saying we're in a tight budget year when in fact there's still quite a bit of flexibility and a lot of creativity that can be put into play. But I think um, one of the points I really try to convey if I'm speaking to a group about the budget process. Um, there are mechanisms of accountability. There are, I think, also some salient points that people understand about state government and the budget being the most important thing that we really do here in the state. It's salient across political lines, whether you're Republican, Independent, or Democrat. And I know that I'm really working to try and make sure people understand Next cycle, we need to talk about comfort topics that aren't necessarily always in the Democrats' wheelhouse. We need to talk about fiscal responsibility and the fact that Branstad Reynolds, if they are the actual brand of the Republican Party in this state, they've already broken clear promises that were made just a few years ago. You know, they've said um, they wanted to create 200,000 new jobs and raise family incomes by 25%. At the very same time that they're proposing a cut to workforce training programs, and they're taking away an opportunity for local government to raise your minimum wage. You know, there's a, a disparity between what is said on the campaign trail and what the GOP has actually done in governing. And we need to make sure that people understand saying one thing and doing another cannot continue into the future. There are accountabilities that have to be put on Governor Branstad, Lieutenant Governor Reynolds, and Republicans in the legislature. There can't be passing the buck and just saying, here's the campaign promise, I hope that it's a a nice one that sounds good to you, but we're not going to actually do anything. And we might actually do something next year that would uh, move in the directly opposite direction. So I, I'm curious most from the group really what uh, some of your questions would be, some of the things that maybe would be worth highlighting in the budget process or, or certainly for the public. Uh, you know, what are the parts of this that you find most frustrating and also least accessible? Those are some of the troubling parts that I think people will really have uh, difficulty in, in this year's budget being as tight as it is. Specifically, a lot of the a lot of the federal not match dollars end up falling within the HHS Health and Human Services budget. Uh, there are certainly some workforce training dollars and other things that are out there. Uh, I know within higher education, it's going to be the cuts to the Leopold Center, the cuts to the Iowa Flood Center, uh, the cuts to the Iowa Energy Center. These are research and development uh, kind of umbrellas that are especially geared toward agriculture clean water, clean soil, uh, and, and trying to make sure that we can draw down federal grants. And those will be certainly impacted if the line items for those programs are zeroed out. Within the Health and Human Services budget, uh, the zeroing out of the Iowa Family Planning Network is going to be a huge one. 
they're actually turning away $3 million of federal money in order to <coughs> basically carry out a grudge against uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, this is something that is incredibly short-sighted. Um, $3 million of federal <coughs> money that are specifically intended for family planning purposes. And they're choosing not to accept those dollars and instead they will try to replicate a system that can't be replicated because much of these uh, access points exist in rural parts of the state where nobody else is actually financially capable of providing the service. Uh, these corporate tax credits have seemed to turn into a big poker game. You know, if you don't give us $100 million to build a fertilizer plant in Weaver, Iowa, we'll move it over to Illinois. Or if you don't give us $100 million for a fertilizer plant in Sergeant Bluff, Iowa, we'll move it to Nebraska. And in South Dakota, who knows how real or not those threats were. But anyway, how could you end this poker game and cut the four to five hundred million a year in corporate tax credits and not have a plea to uh, South Dakota, Kansas, Nebraska, et cetera? Right, and I think the biggest point there is we offer right now one of the most skilled, educated, and productive workforces in the world in Iowa. We need to market to that strength rather than trying to be the lowest bidder every time. So we're the lowest bidder every time. We frankly attract some of the lowest quality jobs in, in the nation as well. The quality employers that are out there that want a reliable, educated, productive workforce are the ones we need to be recruiting to our state and marketing to, to that strength. Now we can't be that qualified, educated, productive workforce if we're cutting community college funding, if we're cutting regions funding, if we're cutting the Iowa tuition grant and private colleges, if we're cutting skilled jobs initiatives. I mean, that's the reality, is uh, we're underfunding public education and we're doing all these cuts to higher education and, and apprenticeship programs. Now we do have to be the lowest bidder every time because our next generation of workers is not the skilled workforce that we have uh, prided our economy on uh, for past generations. So that's the, that's the answer to that question is we want to attract skilled jobs for skilled workers, not the lowest bidder jobs with the lowest quality of life. So how do you cut the money? I mean, there, I, I agree that's a great strategy, but you, you know, once you're in, you're in. And, and how are you going to stop doing this? I think, you know, you can really very quickly when you're talking about tax credits, you can dive into a pretty wonky conversation. And there are some things about our tax credit system that aren't working very clearly. Some of them are uncapped, some of them are automatic, uh, which means in the last two or three years, they've grown by $100 million without the legislature having an effective check on it. We haven't had <coughs> what should be our oversight process in the budget. Um, if, if some of these companies end up qualifying for it, there's few questions asked in the long term about why they're receiving a check from the state, they just continue to do so. And you would think that some of those fixes would be common sense. Uh, last week at the Appropriations Committee, uh, I offered an amendment that had at least 10 planks on it, and it was put together as a menu of options. Here's a menu of different things that will actually positively impact the state's balance sheet. It will do so in the coming budget year, knowing that we're in very difficult shape right now. So these are, we tried to bill it really as a deficit reduction plan. Here's 10 things. Maybe you can't agree on all 10 of them, but they're good ideas, and maybe you can pick three or you can pick five, you know? Each one of them would have a positive impact on the state budget, and the, the frustrating part is that the Republicans really didn't have much interest in taking those ideas up. They're content not to open the can of worms because it's a difficult conversation when you're the one actually governing. Another thing that I'll chip in there, though, is I'll say, you know, Senator Bolton mentions quality of life and also the type of workforce that the state needs to attract. I grew up in Sioux City. We have dealt for decades with South Dakota being right across the river, siphoning off businesses, taking some of our most highly paid professions and taking them right across the river. So they still piggyback off, off all of our infrastructure. They piggyback off our parks. They piggyback off our shopping and recreation and then they pay nothing into our tax base. A race to the bottom is not the, is not the solution. A race to the bottom is not going to provide you the ability to eliminate tax credits by having absolutely no new revenue coming into the state. 
It's all a balancing act. And if they want to reduce the amount of tax credits that we provide in the state by also reducing the corporate income tax rates or other things, it's not a conversation that I think Democrats should be entirely opposed to. We should just validate that they are actually being fair in how these new columns are reworked in the budget process. You can't provide all of these uh, tax cuts to the wealthy and the haves in the state while also taking away tax credits that truly might be working for small companies. Um, so I mean, it's a, it's a balancing act, but I'll say that the Republicans haven't warmed to any of the ideas that we've offered as concrete, tangible thoughts. And if we're talking about competition and kind of the direction of economic development that many states have caught on to, it's all about who their workforce is. The millennials are right now the largest block of the workforce and will continue to be for the next 20 or 30 years. And study after study shows that millennials choose to where they live, not based upon who cuts their paycheck, but it's about what they do outside of work. So the state of Iowa right now is making extremely short-sighted errors in judgment by cutting these programs like water recreation trails, by cutting programs that actually do provide clean water, clean air, outdoor recreation and parks, the stuff that millennials and our future workforce actually wants to see, they're cutting all that stuff right now and it's gonna make it harder to attract a workforce and only increase their need for more tax credits and things down the line to keep these companies moving here. Well, I'd say first and foremost, uh, we're not allowing it to happen. Nobody asked us our permission to, to do that. Um, the reality is this is a golden opportunity for Lieutenant Governor Reynolds, isn't it? Because she's going to be the one making this decision as we have to put a lot more funding into these MCOs to make them solvent, to make sure they turn their profit. Meanwhile, our providers are saying that they're not able to, to get payments on time. They have to restructure how they provide services, the recipients of those services, the people who need the medical care associated with those services are having a hard time navigating that system and getting into facilities because of the delays. And, and the MCOs are telling us, this doesn't really work for us either unless you give us some more money. So maybe this is the golden opportunity to show there's a real difference between uh, the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor when that transition happens. One of, the, one of the things I'll tack on there is just as much as, as vulnerable citizens and those who receive Medicaid have been very directly impacted by this tr transition, providers have had a god awful time. I mean, if you're a hospital and you're seeing your charity care line item go through the roof, if you're a small in-home care provider, you know, somebody that might have a small business, three or five employees, and you're being told by these MCOs that you're not going to get reimbursement for another three or six months or however long they choose. You know, these are uh, companies and healthcare providers as well as citizens receiving the healthcare service that exists throughout the state. And part of it has to be expecting a lot more of each other and making, you know, making sure that people understand this won't change, it won't transition back to a system that was working relatively well uh, unless people, in, especially businesses, reach out to Republican legislators and Lieutenant Governor Reynolds and tell them, hey, you're actually going to have fewer jobs in this rural part of the, of the state uh, if you can't help some sort of reasonable reimbursement process be put into place. If these MCOs are siphoning off all the profit at the expense of businesses and citizens alike, that should raise some red flags and hopefully people would pay attention. If they're not paying attention, Next year's election has to be the moment where they also see that reckoning. Yeah, um, along the same lines of Medicaid, has there been any foresight in this Congress turned Medicaid into a block grant or per capita cap? How that will impact our state budget and Medicaid program here in Iowa? 
That's an excellent question, but I, I don't sense that the state has really has factored out what that would look like quite yet. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the state's dollars. We've got a 7.2 billion dollar budget, but far more than that, the state actually receives federal dollars that we just enact. You know, we we're kind of a pass through, and if they make big changes to the way that Medicaid operates uh, as a block grant or otherwise, it would likely consume a very large share of state dollars that are right now programmed elsewhere. Um, you know, they can. President Trump wants to build that as kind of a, a fiscal responsibility plan for the federal government. Um, I think that he would probably see 50 states quickly wake up and say what dire straits that would put their budget in by year one or two. Um, not many states are, are fiscally well along right now. We're all getting by, but we're not, uh, we're not seeing boom years. Yeah, I'd say that, that kind of goes with the, the question Ken asked earlier of, you know, when we're not funding some of these uh, programs and, and agencies, how does that affect our federal dollars? Obviously, there's a lot of change happening at the federal level, too. We can't predict what all of that is going to be, but we can control our aspect of it, right, to make sure we are providing the base funding that we, at least we need right now to preserve those federal dollars as they exist right now, and oh, by the way, provide the, the simple basic level of services for our state that are needed to keep things running as well. So it's, it's a hard game to predict what's gonna happen with some of these federal programs, but we at least need to take care of things in our own budget. If, if we were in charge, and this is pie in the sky, but would it take a one or two percent if you if you guys were in charge this week and you had one week to fix this, how would you fix it? Can we can we just cut two percent off of all the credits to fix this problem, or is that impossible? I mean, if, if they're looking for solutions, if they were, in in terms of tax credits, yes. Uh, it's it would be very difficult to change in one week's time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is truly one of those issues where you pull on one end of the string and four or five other things start to move, and so. There are tax credits that uh, are very well intended and mostly working, but there might be a couple of, of people who are receiving more than their fair share than they than they ought to. You know. Sure. What we did do in this amendment that I kind of put together last week, the slate of 10, 10 options. Um, each of them is a real a real opportunity and something that the Republicans could choose to adopt and each of them has a positive financial impact on next year's budget. Uh, we, for the dollars that we can absolutely mark down and know their impact, it was around 66 million, um, which, which is not, it's more than halfway to the 131 that the Republicans are borrowing from our reserve accounts, so it's significant. Um, but, you know, some of those things are also votes that they've already chosen not to take. You might not be surprised to hear that raising the minimum wage actually uh, is a positive in the, uh, the state economy. If you raise the minimum wage, you put more dollars into sales tax, you put more dollars into income tax, you have people who are spending more at their local economy, and that all ends up having a positive budget impact <coughs> both at the local and the state level. These are all things that aren't really, they're publicly supported, and also some of them are just real wonky fixes in policy. But all of them are real, and we could have $66 million in one week's time that at least gets half of that deficit wiped off the board. Is your 10 items available to look at sometime? Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've got the long version and the short version. Publicized or, okay, I'll, I'll ask you. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and along with that, you know, we're the ones kind of saying back in January, hey, some things need to change. Can we do it in a week's time? No, we probably can't. It's too late now. But we need to have a long-term vision. That's the frustration that we have is we keep trying to deal with this budget as if it's just today's budget and then tomorrow we deal with it again. We have to have a long-term vision for economic growth in our state. It's inexcusable that we have low unemployment right now and we're still having these types of budget conversations. That means the quality of life needs to be raised and I don't need to find a way to get there as a long-term vision. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The budget, or the, the poor economy, are they the reason for the budget cuts or the excuse? Could you say that one more time? Yeah. Yeah, the economy that we're having, the, the, the lack of revenue, is that the reason for the budget cuts or the excuse? I think, I think the I'll, answer explains a lot of it. 
the, the, the revenue side of our ledger has been whittled back continually over the last few years. And at the same time, many items have been passed which are consuming a larger share of our dollars than they did several years ago. So, I mean, at the same time that they were whittling back revenues, they were putting their foot on the pedal on some of the spending programs. I mean, tax credits have gone up more than $100 million in three years' time. And that it wasn't with legislative approval, it wasn't with new tax credits, it's just that more of these credits were qualified for and so people got the dollars. Um, the revenue side of it right now is very short. People are saying that it's purely the agriculture economy. Governor Branstad has gone on the record time and time again saying this is an ag economy issue. It's really not. Now that's affecting the state economy, but the state budget and the state economy are separate from one another in some forms. Ag is affecting the state economy. It's not the one and sole factor. Uh, but some of these choices over the last few years to uh, give companies a uh, $100 million cut on some of their sales tax dollars that were coming to the state up through last year, that, that's the reason that sales tax is soft this year. It's because of a legislative change that was imposed last year. Even after some Republicans stood up and said early in the session, we can't afford to do this, then the House Republicans forged ahead with it and said, we're gonna do it anyways, we'll see what happens. The reason sales tax dollars this year are soft is because of decisions made by previous legislatures. Um, the economy has been slow but growing for several years right now. I mean, right, people are surprised to hear that Iowa has more than $200 million of new dollars available to it this year than we did last year. It's just that those $200 million have already been absorbed and taken up by tax cuts of yesteryear. Or, I mean, $200 million more than we had last year is enough for us to at least not be making these crazy cuts and these deep, deep gouges to cuts that affect the vulnerable. We should be able to hold them level at worst, uh, but instead, I mean, they're, they're kind of pointing the finger in the opposite direction and saying it's a slow ag economy when really that might be one factor of five or six, but the most direct factors on our state budget are legislative changes made in past years. And, and that's to your point, though, it is, that that's the question we should be asking. The economy is growing. It's just not at the rate we had anticipated. And the revenue estimating conference, those folks have been off on their estimates, and that's been a problem as well. But when they talk about capping our credits, that's a realistic approach. And they also want to cap earned income tax credits which obviously affects our poorest people, but that goes back to Chris's point about raising the minimum wage. If we raise the minimum wage, we wouldn't have as many people on the earned income tax credit, and so you wouldn't be paying out as much to those individuals. It's, you mentioned it earlier, Nate, about us writing checks to the biggest corporations in the state. If we just did them non-refundable to those, that would be an enormous savings. And we, and if we did talk about a true cap and saying we aren't going to go above this any longer, and I know those were part of your 10 list of suggestions, that's what we need to really be focusing on. Two numbers, $12 billion is what we give away in tax credits and ta in the tax cuts, the corporate tax cut. $7.2 billion budget. So what's our highest priority? The giveaways and it's not creating jobs. We have any evidence at all right. that it's created the jobs they promised, the good paying jobs that actually get people off of welfare. That's what we're trying to do, and none of that's happening. would be so rude as to ask if you actually created any jobs with those, those credits. They we don't have Nothing to verify and, and any of that. And it's private. That's, that'll give away top secrets, and they can't tell us anything on whether it's created a job or not. And I think they, where they set their priorities, you stop and think, we're going to lose $3 million federal for family planning services. We're going to spend $700,000 for uh, voter suppression. Mm -hmm. But yet we are getting rid of eliminating the primary care mo uh, mental health treatment, uh, childhood obesity, the Leopold Center, um, child care assistance. You list all these things out that we could have, just those items I listed out, we could have if they put their priorities in the right spot. And I guess that's what's frustrating to me. And if, if Representative Paul could talk to it briefly, the thing that frustrated me too, um, you put a great uh, plan forward with different a menu of items. Yeah. 
you. Talk about where the excess money that the GOP's plan was going to go to and how it was going to help uh, islands. So the Republicans in this in this kind of, you know, I, I think it's just a fake, fake bill that they introduced for press attention, truthfully. But in this bill, they say that their, their long-term goal is to cap these tax credits and reduce them, right? And so you think as soon as you, tap, you cap them and reduce them, boy, that ought to improve the state's balance sheet. That's less costs. That means that we should have more flexible dollars. The Republican proposal is so backwards that they actually have no, no general fund impact. They have no improvement to the state's balance sheet. They cap these tax credits, they reduce their cost, and the, the difference in savings that they find, they actually siphon it off into a taxpayer trust fund account with no intention that has been given. They won't tell us what they want to do with those dollars, but they're going to siphon off about $150 million into an account without name, without intention, there's no identified purpose, they're just going to use it for some sort of overall tax relief goal. And the, the really frustrating part about that for people who care about a budget is that it also keeps our budget artificially tight for the next five years. That's right. The effect of it is that you siphon off all of the flexible dollars that you've created, it keeps your budget tight because all of these dollars go into an unnamed account. So they continue to tell you it's a tight budget year, it's a tight budget year, we're going to continue to cut line items for victims of crime violence, you know? And so they continue to keep a lean budget and at the same time they siphon off over $100 million with no intended purpose that has been said yet. Um, it's just, it's backward and also just such a poor example of what government has the potential and expectation to do. I want to thank all of um, you for being here and thank uh, Senator Bolton and Representative Hall for presenting to give them a round of applause.